Hi everyone, um, and this is the project one overview for ECE 3311 principle of communication systems. So uh, in this video, I'm just going to go briefly through the project one uh, that just got released a couple of days ago um, and kind of describe step by step uh, what I'm looking for, um, some quick start uh, tips in order to get going with respect to this project, uh, and also like, uh, you know, the g gaining familiarity with the tools, right? Again, um, in this course, we're going to be dealing with Python, which uh, based on sort of queries I've done to the class, in particular, the uh, poll that I posted in uh, Slack, um, indicated that a lot of you have heard of it, uh, may have used it once or, or a couple of times uh, in the past, but uh, um, you know, other than that, like uh, proficiency is kind of like at perhaps a novice, maybe the intermediate level. There was one person who indicated expert level, and so that's excellent. That's perfect. Um, I think the majority of you kind of are like more in that novice intermediate uh, range. So uh, again, I want to kind of go through this project because this is supposed to bring everybody or most people uh, to that sort of base level from which you can do the remaining five projects for this course. All right, so let's get started. So uh, here, uh, what we see is the handout. Uh, the objectives, again, um, increase familiarity if you're not familiar, too familiar with Python, uh, gain familiarity with this computing language, the programming language, right? Uh, secondly, very importantly, is to learn more about the available libraries out there and tools uh, that support Python in doing specifically communications and signal processing related uh, operations for this class, right? It's not just Python. We want Python with a number of libraries that really are important tools in order to do the analysis and study and investigation of communication systems. Uh, and then finally, um, very important because this is what we're gonna be doing for all six uh, projects is uh, gaining uh, some level of understanding and uh, uh, mastery of something called Jupyter Notebook, okay? Uh, so we're not going to be submitting like lab reports, right, or project reports uh, for, for this course where you, you open up a Word document, you, you write up 20 pages, and you submit that. No, uh, we're going to be using something called Jupyter Notebook, uh, which is a, a self-contained uh, type of format where you take Python code and uh, you integrate it in in a something called a Jupyter notebook. So what it does is it very nicely displays the code. Uh, obviously, very important. You also have to comment your code. Otherwise, it's you know it's going to be very difficult to follow. And at, as well as run the the different snippets of code that you insert uh, that include any sort of uh, plotting routines as well. So this is going to be a great, uh, great tool to use for this class. All right. So the preparation, super duper important, is having a Python install on your uh, computer in order to do these uh, these projects. Again, um, like if you're you feel comfortable with Python and comfortable with uh, how you installed it and libraries, and you have a certain level of proficiency. Um, uh, then that's fine. Like you know, you could use your native install on on your on your computer. You don't you don't have to do uh, what I'm recommending for folks who are not familiar with it um, um, or need to build up a certain level of confidence in Python, in running Python, installing Python, uh, and using it for for this course. Okay. In which case, uh, I distributed uh, something called a virtual disk image or a VDI. Okay. And what that is essentially is um, the image of an operating system, in this case, Ubuntu 20.04.1, uh, uh, that has the Python, that has Python and all the relevant libraries for this course already installed on it with an editor for, um, uh, for doing a lot of the development work you're going to be using Python for in terms of the communication system building and analysis, all right? So, um, so very importantly, um, like, you know, I have actually a tutorial on, on installing um, uh, a virtual machine, 
software called VirtualBox that will take the VDI, right? And we'll run it. And what you're gonna get is this really cool looking window that looks like the Linux operating system. And in fact, it is. It's just being run in your native operating system on your computer. So you have, let's say you're running Windows or Mac or Linux, then you have VirtualBox, and then you have an operating system in it. So you basically have an operating system in an operating system. Sounds weird, but you're gonna notice, okay? One thing, and it might be a bit frustrating, that it's a little slow, and that's because you're running an operating system not on the computing hardware of your laptop or desktop computer or server, but you're running an operating system on an operating system that's running on, a, on computing hardware. So it's being emulated a little bit, right? So got to install VirtualBox, and I have a separate video which I uh, put into uh, the projects uh, folder in f under files in uh, the ECE3311 canvas. So please check that out. That's a separate one. And that has a ready to use uh, disk image uh, for ECE3311, right? So separate video, check it out if you're gonna go down this path, right? In case you are do, gonna do it yourself and you want to install it natively on your computer and not run VirtualBox or any of that, uh, these are the, uh, ver the version of the, of the different things that uh, you'll need in order to run the, uh, the, the six projects for this course uh, in terms of Python, Python, PIP, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and VS Code. Again, VS Code is optional. That's the development environment. A lot of folks seem to be very comfortable with something called PyCharm, uh, P-Y-C-H-A-R-M, um, including some of my grad students. So if you feel comfortable in that environment instead of uh, Virtual Studio Code, go right ahead, all right? So uh, again, uh, one very important note, and this is in red and bold, is that if you do go on your own, right, and install Python natively on your computer instead of using the disk image, um, and you know, you, you, even if you use the same version of Python pip, NumPy, and all the rest, right? Um, and things don't work. Oh, my dependency is not working. I can't find this library. Oh, something's messed up. And you come to us, we can't help you, right? We can't go and spend uh, potentially hours trying to go through your operating system in order to figure out what's going on. Uh, if you're going to go on your own, you're literally on your own. If you're going to use the disk image, then we can assist because we know exactly how the disk image works, okay? Right. So uh, the other thing is, uh, so this project, the handout's already posted. It's in, if you go under assignments to project one, it's there. It's a PDF file. You can download the exact same document we're staring at right now on the screen here. Uh, the other thing that's going to be there is a file that has an extension IPYNB. And that, folks, is the Jupyter Notebook with all these examples we're about to look at um, uh, like uh, like uh, for this project, okay? So Kartik was really awesome. He put, he put together this Jupyter Notebook of examples that will help get you started with respect to Python. All right, cool. So first of all, getting started with Python basics. So before you even do that, all right, let's, let's pick up where we left off with, uh, with from the installing, uh, installing VirtualBox, okay? So, Last, where we last left off, this is pretty much what we saw with respect to uh, the installing of VirtualBox. And, and it's like, you, I kind of got caught in kind of an awkward moment. It's like, hmm, password. And it's even more awkward because it's my first name and not Alexander. People call me Alexander when I'm in trouble. Uh, it's Alex, A-L-E, A-L-E-X. Let's try one more time, A-L-E-X. And then one, two, three, four, very safe, okay? And da 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 I told you it was gonna be slow, right? So operating system is thinking. Uh, there we go, finally decided to wake up and say, oh, okay, I'm supposed to log in. Now, I set the default screen uh, resolution to something that should fit most computers unless like you run your operating system on like uh, 800 by 600, in which case this is gonna be beyond that. 
Um, but it's extremely inconvenient unless you don't mind looking through a straw when you're programming um, uh, you know, any of these things in, 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 in the course. So first things first, if you want to um, uh, program and, and not kind of like suffer like, you know, like, you know, just like, you know, looking like, like, you know, a really small posted stamp surface area. What I would recommend if you have the real estate, uh, display real estate to make this bigger, go to this like, you know, nine little dot thingy and then uh, go to settings. Okay. And now settings is going to open up. Uh, on the left bar here, click display. And then here on the right side, right now, uh, the default that everybody should have is 10, 1024 by 768. Eh, it's a little small. I would change that. You know, whatever your, your computer monitor at home fits. Uh, but let's say something not ridiculous, okay? So let's say 1280 uh, by 960. And then you click apply. Uh, yes, much better. Okay, so keep changes. So this is what we're going to... This is what we're going to play with, all right, in our development environment. Let's let's actually uh, stretch this out a little bit long, bigger because I can afford to. <sighs> or maybe I can't. Yeah, see? Silly, Wiglinski. Let's change it again. Let's make it a little bit wider. Mm -hmm -hmm. What's the wide aspect stuff? Is it that? Let's apply. No, 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 no. See, see, this is this is why we. Um, that's it. like, of course, I'm looking at a really tiny monitor here. So, you know, that's what happens when you work from the basement. So, um, we could do that. That's a good one. Apply. Yeah, that's the winner. All right. So this is what, uh, what you'll see, close the window. And it's like, okay, so I now have a little bit more real estate. You're gonna probably really hate this cougar with lasers coming out of its eyes uh, by the end of this term. And what should happen is, um, if you go here, you double click that, that's like home, or at least that's uh, the computer, yeah. So home, this is what's in your home, right? Um, and then, what happened is I created a, a folder called ECE3311 projects. If you go into that, uh, all you're gonna find is ECE3311 underscore nth, which is the environment, right? Uh, this, this helps, this is for the virtual environment that Python's gonna be running in, um, uh, in this folder, right? This is your projects folder. I created something called project underscore one, oh one. You can call it whatever. It's recommended that you probably separate every project in this course so you don't have files flying all over the place. If we go into project 01, I downloaded in advance the uh, Jupyter notebook for this project. Um, one thing to note is very, very, very important is that any file that you save in the image uh, if the image flakes out and dies and stuff and you have your entire project in, in here and you didn't back it up anywhere, you're toast. So highly recommended backup to the cloud as much as possible. So you could go like Google or Dropbox and save your stuff there or OneDrive. Just make sure you back up, okay? Because let's say your image flakes out. Uh, all you do is you throw away the image. You get another image from the same location you got this image from, install it into VirtualBox, and you're all set and you keep on going, right? Because you have a backup in the cloud. And then here's the Jupyter Notebook, all right? So now um, what happens is this little ribbon thingy, that's Virtual Studio Code. You click on that once. And then something happens slowly and this is your interface you get welcome it's all nice and and cool looking this thing at the bottom uh that's essentially your terminal right so just in general like you have the terminal window here right uh looks like ms dot but no it, this is your linux terminal 
right? So you can do LS and these are your files. You can go CD, ECE projects and you do LS again and you can go CD into projects and LS again and you have that file. So essentially the bottom window there, that's, that's your terminal window for, uh, for virtual studio code. So if you wanna run stuff, um, it's awesome. Like, you know, you can run things and that would be pretty cool. Let's, let's get rid of the welcome, okay? So let's get rid of that. Right now, pay very close attention to this thing here, right? Uh, this is gonna be very helpful because it's gonna indicate what environment that you'll be operating in. You really wanna make sure that this indicates that you're playing with Python 3, right? So what you do is you go to file, you go to open file. I already did this before, right? So you go to ECE3311, the home, you go to, EC, oh, sorry, that's the folder ECE3311. It's in your home directory. You go into ECE3311 projects. You then go into projects 01, if that's the name of the folder you're creating for project one. And here's your Jupyter notebook. Double click it. And then let, let stuff happen. And what the stuff is gonna do is uh, VS code, right? That's a short, short abbreviation for a virtual studio code. So we're gonna call it VS code. VS code is gonna do the entire environmental setup for you, right? So it says, oh, it's a .ipynb file. I'm gonna to have to set it up as a virtual note, uh, Jupyter notebook, no problem. So notice, first of all, very importantly, that it indicates here that it, this is, oh, it's a Jupyter notebook, but very importantly, it's Python 3.8.5 64-bit edition. Okay, great. Very important. Super important. This is also kind of important. What happens here is Jupyter Notebook in general um, is essentially um, an interactive web server type of thing uh, that sort of displays your, your uh, Python code in a kind of a user accessible manner. Uh, this is kind of like an add-on to the VS Code um, um, sort of environment. So it, it, it makes it look like, hey, it looks like um, um, shucks. It looks like a, a web server. And then this in particular, it's local hosts. So there is a Jupyter server like it's a web server and it's local, it's local. So it's not on the internet. You're not seeing any other website. It's just like local to this machine. Now, uh, this is very important. So what happens is in Jupyter Notebook, you're gonna have this really cool stuff. What happens is each one of these numbers uh, denotes something called a cell, right? So it's a module, right? And what this cell does right, is a sort of logically contained Python code, right? And it's a sort of uh, fluid consciousness, okay, a sequence of these cells that contain Python code, one after another, after another, after another. Very importantly, what's really nice about Python is the following. So if I'm running some code, I'm gonna make the terminal a little bit smaller. All right. Uh, what's really cool about it is that you have, okay, some, some code. Now here's some more code in this cell. And if I were to run the cell, specifically the cell, it's going to spit out the output into Jupyter Notebook. So this is super important because what this does, okay, is that it's going to allow you to do, uh, the, you know, to put all, all your Python code, also super important, okay? Documentation, 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 you know? So there's a, a title to this cell and there's documentation that goes along. This is kind of like very brief, but if let's say you wanna put paragraphs, remember that commenting is the hash mark, right? So hash mark, and everything after the hash mark is comment. It's not executed, right? These are, and I'm gonna talk about each one of these in a few minutes. And then at the end of the cell, you run the cell and vv, output. And you can do it for every cell. That's what's so cool about this, right? The Jupyter Notebook. And then you save it. And then you submit this. You submit specifically this and only this to Canvas for your project submissions, 
All right? All right. So let's shrink this for a minute. So we'll get back to Jupyter Notebook, okay? But Python basics. So very important. So the reason we're doing Python this year is because Python is like, sure, folks use programming languages and things like MATLAB and such. But reality is, is that a lot of my grad students, a lot of people who leave WPI afterwards and go into a variety of different communities, including communications, very quickly pick up and use extensively Python, okay? It's very powerful. Um, it has a lot of functionality. Um, it can, and, and, the, and uh, also very nicely, it, it's great when you run it on like connecting it with hardware, very much so. That's, that's part of the reason we're using Python here is because the potential for it to be used in conjunction with radio hardware. Um, and, and also a lot of employers love Python because guess what? It's free. It's 100% free, okay? So, so some of the basic commands. The first one, and we already saw this in the, in the um, shucks, in, in the, uh, the Jupyter Notebook, is something called the import command. So what import command does is, okay, you have Python, and what ends up happening is, oh, uh, I need to import XYZ function. Uh, you might say, what, 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 uh, sorry, sorry, not X, Y, Z. So suppose I want to run something in NumPy. Well, but NumPy is not part of Python directly. It's a library. I got to import the library. So what import does is something, you'll say import NumPy. All right. But NumPy by itself, it's five characters. It's kind of inconvenient because if I want to specify, so if you see a NumPy command, it's going to be NumPy dot, arrange numpy dot concatenate numpy dot can i shorten numpy can i make it two characters so a lot of folks what they do is they say import numpy as np so it does two things simultaneously it imports numpy the library into your environment okay so now you have access to all the numpy functions in python and then i also use a shorthand it's like import numpy as np. So when I run a numpy command, I don't have to say numpy dot concatenate. I say np dot concatenate. Whew. Makes life easier, right? So that's the first thing. So so you're gonna see it again. You're gonna you well as you write, uh, like you know this uh, this project. There's gonna be a little bit of like like you know learning by example. So you're gonna be doing some of this, okay? And one is import NumPy. The other thing is data types and structures. So in Python, there, there's a variety of both like, uh, like uh, uh, the variable as well as structural uh, types. So in terms of like the variable data types, there's integer, there's float, there's string, and there's Boolean, right? Integer is one, two, three, four, five, six. Float is 1.1429 three, string, hello world, and Boolean is true and false, right? So the way you define it, and let's go back to our friend, the, um, uh, the, the um, shucks, Jupyter Notebook, okay? Let's go to cell two. So here, this is an example of a string being, uh, being assigned to a variable x1. Right? So this is how you assign to a variable. Except be very careful. There's no semicolon at the end or comma. It's literally x underscore one equals quotes, right? Double quotes, hello class, exclamation mark. Right? And then the numericals, like x underscore two is equal to 3311. That's your integer. 3311.5, that's your float. You can even do complex. And J is recognized as the square root of minus one. There's also things called lists, tuples, and range. Okay, those are the structural, uh, structural sequence types, right? So list is like uh, an array, right? Or a vector. So if you have uh, X underscore four equals square brackets, very important, square brackets, these elements, boop, 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 boop. What you got here 
is a sequence of three strings. Remember, double quotes, this is not the number. Oops, I made a slight boo-boo there. X underscore five creates something called a tuple. Tuples are almost like lists, except there's this thing called mutable. What the heck is mutable? Mutable means I can modify it. I could replace an element in X underscore four because it's a list. I can add an element to list, okay? This X underscore four. But a tuple, if I define a tuple, a tuple is defined almost like a list except it uses round brackets. And those tuples cannot be modified. They're immutable, all right? Range, range is very convenient. What range does is, if you say range six, like here, it does zero, one, two, three, four, five, okay? Or range 10, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What it does is it creates uh, a list of these elements starting at zero all the way, but not including the number that's specified. And then print is very handy because print, what it enables you to do is it prints to command line to the terminal, the, uh, whatever the argument is to print, which is really awesome. And that's what you see down here, right? So what's X? X is equal to three, X plus one, four and two and all that jazz. And you can also print out a bunch of other things. Len here is length of whatever X4 is, that's a list. And it's, uh, in this case, three elements. So moving along, okay. So what I want to see, okay, from, uh, from all of you for your submission for project one, is it one Jupyter notebook that, that implements the solutions to every one of the 10 questions asked in this project handout? And there are point values assigned to every question, okay? So for instance here, suppose you're given the following snippet of code, blah, 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 right? And an error occurs. What happens is there's something called typecasting. Use it and then provide the source code and the solution for resolving that error here, okay? Now, this for loops is a bit wonky, okay? I, I have to admit, I, even I looked at it and said, I, I don't understand how for loops work here. It doesn't look like anything that you might've seen in something like C or C++ or MATLAB or Pascal for that matter. So what a for loop looks like Let's bring again the Jupyter Notebook. So the Jupyter Notebook is gonna be your friend. So at least for this project and maybe for a couple of others, you're gonna look for it for guidance in terms of getting started using this language syntactically correct, okay? And the other thing is if you ever run into problems, usually the, you know, honestly the internet, like, you know, if let's say, oh, I forgot how to use that function. I really don't know the details. If you put something like, let's say NP arrange, right? NP, NumPy, dot A-R-A-N-G-E. There's tons of like reference materials on how to use it out there, as well as a lot of uh, wiki and, and like Reddit posts and stuff on, on people asking questions on like particular errors that they might be experiencing. So cell four talks about for loops. So for loops is a bit weird. So notice that I don't have to predefine um, any of these variables. So here, the for loop, okay, the way it works is the following. For i, i is the for loop index. In, that's pretty much your, your equal sign, right? Uh, but, but it also, what it does is it's here, so there's several weird things that happen here. For i in range 10, remember what range does. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. What for i equal, uh, for, for i in range 10 means is basically take your for loop and i equals uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it says, so basically the way it works is, okay, for i equals zero, execute everything beneath it that's indented. So this is a little bit weird, okay? So Python is space sensitive. 
Another language that's space sensitive is actually Fortran. So if any of you have used Fortran, it too is space sensitive and kind of an interesting factoid. So what happens is suppose you have this, then you have this indented thing, and then you don't have an indented thing after that. It's aligned with the four. The thing immediately after the values that's not indented does not get executed until after the for loop is completed. So what the for loop will do is it's going to iterate 10 times with the index assuming a value at every in iteration, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's, and, and let's say you had another line after values that is indented, it too will be executed within the for loop, right? So for i, okay, in range 10, so it's going to be i equals 0. Execute this line. Um, shucks. No, let's not do that. Just uh, fooey. Okay, so let's just let's do that. There we go. So let's say I do that, and then I do that. So what I've just done, okay, is notice that here for i in range 10, so it's going to say i equals 0, and it's going to be 0 times 0.1 values.append. And you might say, what the heck is values.append? So that's interesting. So lists, okay. Um, lists are both values and functions. So what this list will have, values, so values equals empty brackets means the list is empty, it just exists. When I do values.append, what that means is take, okay, whatever is the input to values.append. Now it's a function, okay? In this case, it's i times 0.1. So in this case, 0 times 0 0.1 is going to be equal to 0. And append it to the list values. OK, cool. Then, so now values is a list of one, one entry, one element, and it's 0. Then print the value of i, 0. Now, i is equal to 1. Values.append i which is 1 times 0.1. So now the input to values.append is 0.1. So now what I get is values is equal to 0 and 0.1. And then I print i, which is 1. And I keep on doing that. That's the funky thing about Python, is lists are both lists, but they're, so they're a bunch of values and a structure. And they're also functions. Okay, so that's how the for loop works. So really, you know, try this out. So let's minimize that. And so here's a great example. I, for question three, I want you to implement uh, a couple of for loops. One doing this with a bunch of string, strings, okay? And one doing this with, with strings. Functions. Functions are gonna be very, very important. Because what functions are going to do is they're going to, you'll see them everywhere. They're defined as def, right? So when you say def, in this case, the function's name is foo, and you have x as the input, and then return is it spits out from foo whatever your input is plus whatever is being processed within the function. In this case, uh, foo, what it does is it takes the input and it squares it and, and returns that value. Right? So in this case, if you have print foo three, it takes three, squares it nine, and then prints out the output here with the print function. So you're going to see that quite a bit because what, what happens is that's a great way of, instead of typing out a lot of stuff or the same operation that's repeated over and over again, you just use a function, just like with every other programming language. So you'll see that here in cell number cell number five, okay? So definitely try it out. 
Here in this case, cell number five also introduces, in a very sneaky way, ha, 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 the conditional. So this is if, right? And again, indent sensitive, right? So if x is greater than zero, everything that follows that's indented is, is considered part of that condition. And then this is else if, and that's else. Okay, there's no end, there's no squiggly brackets. Remember, everything here is indent sensitive. So be very careful about your spacing. Now, let's move on. So this is not a cell, but I think you, all of you should be very, very super duper mindful of this. So Python makes, uses, makes use of a lot of classes and a lot of objects, right? So what happens is classes define objects, right? So what happens is um, sometimes what you want to do is you want to create something that's like, you know, your own, your own object that's really tailored to a specific need that makes your program a lot more efficient to use, right? For instance, um, suppose I want to create an object called student. And what student does is it contains the name of a student. And you say, okay, this is kind of like, I'm just choosing a very simple case. You can make, you can make basically an object that could be super duper complicated, contains a whole bunch of information, uh, and as well as functions that manipulate that information as you go along. So you could, you could make a whole bunch of objects, put them into whatever your script is and your, your, your program, and it's, it could be compact, because you, it's, all self, it's all supported by these objects that you're defining. So suppose I define an object, okay? So class student, and the syntax is kind of really weird, okay? I, 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 I'm gonna say it weird at first because you don't really see this in, in a lot of other programming languages. So what you do in case of defining a class student, okay, this is the object, what you may want to do is, first of all, do def, hey, looks like a function, sure it is. And what happens is def, first of all, you're going to have um, underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, self, name. So what the heck is this? So what this is, this means this is initializing all the values that, uh, that are in your object, okay? So what happens is suppose that you're gonna create, okay, something called like little s student. What you do is little s student is equal to big s student, that's this class, and then in the input is Bob, right? So the way to read that is self, refers to whatever stu student is being used. In this case, this guy here. So self refers to little s student. And what Bob is here in input initializes little s student in terms of its name. So self.name, in this case, self is student. So student.name is, is going to be equal to Bob. So if you do this and then you say print, student.name, it's initialized with Bob. Then you have another function, def change name, self, com, uh, comma, new name, and then self.name is equal to new name. So what this means is suppose I execute student.change name, now I'm running this student as a function student dot name cha uh, change name and then the input to that function is Jill I'm executing the change name function and what's the change name function whatever is the input replaces self dot name so now the new uh, student dot name variable is going to be equal to Jill not Bob so the reason why I'm kind of picking on this is you're going to see this everywhere in Python. So I just want to give kind of like, you know, the stuff that, so just, a, uh, just a, in full, full disclosure, 
I, I'm, I myself am learning Python like, like as you folks are learning Python, except that I think I have like a five day head start. But uh, I've been jumping into it and it's a lot of fun. So these are kind of the things that I'm discovering that I'm saying, you know what? You folks might find this very interesting. Okay, so I'm just saying heads up, this is actually pretty important to know. Uh, and main reason is, the reason why you wanna pick this apart is, um, in case you're trying to use something and say, I don't know how this works, being able to decode things like underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, it's kind of important, okay? So here's kind of like a summary of the lessons learned in terms of classes and objects. And question five is about doing exactly that, making your own class and object. Now, NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib. So these are, you're gonna use a lot in this class. NumPy, it's a lot of numerical stuff. Oh, there's a lot of numerical stuff, especially array and matrix processing. Very, very important in this class. SciPy, there's some really cool functions, including convolution, which is critical for this class. And matplotlib, no one wants to make their own plotting routines from scratch. Matplotlib, super cool, okay? It's a great way of plotting your results. Okay, so we look at that. So let's actually go back to our friend, aye. Oop. I told you it was slow. <laughs> so let's go, yeah, cell number six. In cell number six, what you can see is the one of the very important things that you're gonna be using matplot, uh, sorry, numpy for is something called NP array. So instead of making a list of integers or a list of floats, this is very nice because um, NumPy array is, is a great way of creating uh, that, uh, like, in, like what it will do, it will take that list, okay? And it's gonna convert it uh, into a sort of like, you know, a numerical array that uh, uh, NumPy can then manipulate with a whole bunch of different functions, okay? So use NP array, convert whatever list you have, in this case, X4, create X, and then you can do a lot, of, you can manipulate it uh, with a variety of other uh, NumPy functions, like there's NumPy zeros, NumPy ones. All of this does is it creates arrays of ones, arrays of zeros. Um, you can also do, um, this is actually kind of really important. So NP arrange, uh, what that does is it creates zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? It's just like range, right? Um, and uh, it, it, there's, there's a few other type of, there's actually one that I really like called linspace, so numpy linspace. And what that does is if you specify uh, the endpoint and you can also specify sort of fractional spacing. So let's say 0 0.001, 0 0.002, 0 0.003, all the way to one, that you can do with NP linspace and it will evenly space out. Like, so, so what you'll do is you, let's say specify the endpoint and you specify the number of points you want between zero and that endpoint. Absolutely fantastic function. So there's a variety of different functions that um, definitely play around with this code because you're gonna be using this a lot in, in this class, uh, uh, the NumPy, okay? And also, uh, before I uh, forget, SciPy, so first of all, there's a really cool example here in terms of convolution. So what we did here in cell seven, this is the definition of convolution. Remember, like if you have two, two arrays, how do you convolve them? Flip one, and then what happens? Shift, multiply them against each other, element by element, add them together, shift, do the same thing, shift, do the same thing, do, 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 do. That's what cell seven does in a horrible, 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 horrible way, right? Uh, and then for the rest of us that try to save time, there's something called signal convolve, right? And that is from SciPy. But very importantly, okay? So that's cell eight. Cell, and then uh, cell nine, where there's some basic signal processing algorithms. This is pretty awesome. So this is matplotlib. So this allows you to generate 
things like that, right? Makes really cool plots. All you need to do is put what the x-axis and y-axis data are, the labels for x-axis and y-axis, and then show it. And then you're off to the races. And there's more functionality and stuff, but um, what we, we're just showing some of the basic functionality. And you can export, again, tons of documentation online. And this project, it's not exhaustive. There's tons of material out there. But again, we really just want to get you all your hands dirty in terms of playing around with, uh, with Python in these libraries. All right? Uh, and then, ah, ha, 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 this is super important. So there's uh, NumPy cosine, NumPy side. So you're going to see lots of cosine and sine functions in this course. So you're going to really need to, uh, you're going to be using these two a lot. And then matplotlib, um, again, for the plotting of like these time domain and frequency domain functions. There's also an FFT function. This is going to be used for the conversion of the time domain information into the frequency domain. And all of that is done here in cells nine and 10, all right? So here's the FFT function. Uh, we also added something about like file read and file write, in this case, specifically for audio files. So if you want to hear tones, ha <laughs> ha, uh, then you can, you can definitely run this, uh, uh, this Python script as well. So, so this, okay, so really in a nutshell, what this, uh, what this project is doing is really it's exposing you to sort of the syntax, getting kind of used to the Python environment. You're gonna make a lot of mistakes. It's gonna come out with a lot of errors. So really don't, don't, uh, don't worry, it's okay. Even I've, I've been making a lot of errors when I've been programming, uh, but, but, it's, but you get used to it. And then you say, ah, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. And soon this is gonna become second nature. By the end of seven weeks, you'll be pretty comfortable with using Python with respect to designing and understanding communication systems, right? Okay. Then finally, Jupyter Notebook. Um, I think uh, in the sort of like the really, really basic, basic uh, approach, and here's sort of a um, sort of um, uh, what I've been talking about. Well, what, what this does is you can create a Jupyter Notebook, okay? It has an extension I, P, P, Y, and B, okay? And you create these cells and then you can run these individual cells right, in VS Code. So VS Code is a kind of a nice environment. Again, like some people use PyCharm, that's fine. We didn't install PyCharm. If you want to do that, that's fine. Uh, and there might be other editors out there for programming in Python, but uh, we installed VS Code, right? And so like for instance, like let's, let's go into this environment. So let's say I want to create a new file. Do, 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 do. And I want to save it. Okay. And suppose I want to call it, um, let's call it foo. foo.ipynb. All righty. And then I say save. And it's going to recognize it as, and, um, uh, no, thank you. I usually say no, thank you because um, I don't know. Just the way I am. Okay, so what should happen is it takes a little bit of time, but eventually what happens is VS Code says, ah, you want a Jupyter Notebook. And now you're, now you're cooking with gas. So it's, yeah, there we go. So give it a little bit of time. And then the first thing that happens is uh, you're going to get a cell. Right? So this here, run line by line, change to markdown, uh, and then run cell. So then what you do is let's say you print let's do the hello world. Hello world, and then you do that. Okay, cool beans. And then you say, I'm gonna run this. There we go. Now, now you're, now you're, now that's cool. Now let's do something really awesome. So let's say we do hmm, like A equals like a 1.0 and then B is equal to 2.0. And then you say C is equal to um, A times B. 
and then you print the output. I C, and then you run that thing, bloop, and it's two. So, and then what you do is you just save that, and you're all set. Just let it save. <laughs> at some point. So this is, folks, this is how you would do uh, your, your uh, you know, your, at the end of the day. Ah, yeah, sorry, I have to do that. So this is how at the end of the day you would be doing like your Jupyter Notebook. And very importantly, that's what gets submitted. Now, uh, what I would really like folks to do are things like this, like course number, project team number, uh, number, uh, names of team members and submission date, right? And I want you to document everything, like big time. I really do want all of you to document everything. So um, how you would do that? So let, let's say we go back to this. So I would go here, I would say uh, question one, okay? Uh, for this question, we simply wrote a um, print statement that communicated hello world to the terminal, right? So doc that's what I mean by documentation. I really do want to see documentation, something along those lines, because there's not going to be a report. This is going to be your submission. So it's so important that you have something like this. Now, um, I'm going to have to think if I can add another. Hmm. So let's say we add another cell below. There we go. And then boop. So let's say here you could add, you know, maybe you can put something like, let's say, Project one, uh, O1, right? Uh, do to November 20, 5 p.m. Team um, 100, because they're awesome. And then team members is Bob Smith, Smith, Bob. Joe, um, I don't know. I'm going to Francois. Okay. Um, and Alex Wiglinski, right? So let's say all of us. So your first cell should be something. And you know what's going to happen is if you execute it, it's going to say, huh, um, you know, that doesn't run anything. And that's fine. But I do want something to indicate who the team is, right? So what's the project? Uh, when is it due? What's your number? And uh, what's your team, uh, the membership of your team? All right. So there should be some sort of identifying information here. All righty. So with that, folks, um, um, I hope this was kind of helpful. Uh, like if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to uh, Kartik. He's, he's, again, like he knows the most Python between the two of us. Uh, again, I'm learning. So uh, I'm just a few days ahead of most of you, I believe. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I'm going to probably jump and fall into the same pitfalls a lot of you are going to fall into. So with that, um, hopefully this was helpful. And uh, yeah, again, this is the Project One overview. Okay.